Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us today. And welcome to Cross-Border Digital Policies for Africa Key Findings Workshop. We're very pleased to have you here with us. And before we get started, I just wanted to share a few housekeeping rules with you. Few housekeeping rules with you, excuse me. Uh, I'll just let people in. Excellent. So um, this meeting is going to be recorded as you have heard right now. And uh, as we record, we'll be able to share with you some of the resources that will be available after the meeting. We ask all participants that are joining us from all over if they could please mute their microphones so that we can reduce the background noise. I would also like to share with you that you can join us and in the chat box and tell us where you're coming from because we'd love to hear where you're coming from so that you can interact with each other and share your messages with us. Later on in the program, we will also um, be allowing you to come together uh, and to hear what we have to share with you regarding <clears throat> the key findings. And sorry, one second, I will just... Excuse me. We have uh, our, our, um, our agenda today uh, with a welcome and introduction, and I'll be giving an opening and presentation of the pro pro project and our current milestones. And we'll introduce uh, the framing. There'll be an introduction and framing from the executive director, Dr. Uh, Mr. Bertrand de la Chapelle, who's the executive director of INJ then followed by a presentation of the key findings of the Internet and Jurisdictions Cross-Border Digital Policy for Africa, with opening remarks from Dr. Allison Gilwald and Dr. Allison and her team at ICT Research, Research ICT Africa, have been authoring uh, the report for uh, uh, our Cross-Border Digital Policies for Africa. You will be then given an opportunity to provide mm -hmm. questions to share your questions to the authoring team, providing your reactions uh, and perspectives collected to date, and then uh, with an opportunity to, pro to identify priority areas and amplify the African perspectives. Next, we'll have cl uh, our closing remarks and a networking session. So before we get started, I just wanted to share with you uh, about INJ, who we are, what we do. So we enable stakeholders to collaboratively address the transnational policy challenges of the digital first 21st century uh, to ensure policy coherence and legal interoperability with the three objectives in our mission to inform the debates, uh, to enable evidence-based uh, evidence policy innovation, to connect stakeholders and also to advance concrete solutions concrete solutions, uh, bridging um, the processes and actors in the digital economy, human rights, and cybersecurity. We also, we, so the project, the Africa project uh, has a two-year timeline and it is supported by our, by GIZ, the German Development Agency. So we're very thankful for the support they've given us for this project which is running over two years with the objective to complement existing uh, regional mechanisms for stakeholders from the African continent in order to share knowledge, to consult one another, and to interact, interact with international stakeholders and develop capacity on addressing cross-border digital policies for Africa. The outcomes of this are recurring workshops, and we've already had two workshops, knowledge dialogue workshops, uh, whereby uh, stakeholders were able to connect with one another, local experts to support knowledge and exchange, and to also develop the and um, introduce the thematic issues that are pressing and impacting Africa and African uh, stakeholders. 
The uh, result will be uh, the development of the status report. So the data collection ex exercise that we've had uh, in um, that uh, kicked off at the African Internet Governance Forum in Malawi um, allowed us to collect uh, the data with an online survey, uh, online survey interviews, and um, with, with key stakeholders. Uh, finally, there'll be multimedia learning modules that are tailor-made for capacity building. I would like to also share with you that we've been very fortunate to have a global, global and uh, African uh, interaction into our project with 200 plus registrations to the Knowledge Dialogue workshops. We've had over 100 uh, data contributors and interviews combined with over 300 representatives from uh, around the globe. So on the map, you can, uh, you can see who have been involved, the different stakeholder groups, academia, civil society, government, private sector, the technical community, African regional and international organizations. These are the contributors that we have so far. We've listed you, and as as uh, as indicated to you, we are acknowledging you in the report, uh, and thank you very much for your active participation in the online surveys and the work that we have been doing. So, without further ado, I would like to now hand over to our executive director, Mr. Bertrand de la Chapelle who will take us through and introduce us and frame the work that we've been doing for the Africa project. Thank you very much, Tracy. And it's a pleasure to, uh, to see everyone, even if it's just with the names. Uh, if you want to activate your, your camera, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's highly welcome. Um, I see that we are more than 60 people in the, in the room, and it's a pleasure to uh, introduce this work. As a preliminary uh, element, I want to um, highlight the, the, the following. Uh, this is an exercise that is intended to document the initiatives uh, around the world that, um, or not in around the world, but in Africa, that, and basically identify what are the key uh, challenges that um, the African continent is confronted with. And I want to uh, highlight that the focus of the work has been on the policy dimension. So the report is not going to cover all the uh, important work that is being done by businesses or civil society uh, in Africa. The focus of the report is about the policy dimension. And one of the objectives is to make sure that we help frame the debate in a way that is helping it move it forward. And we start by a, a quote by um, uh, His Excellency Kwesi Kate, uh, who intervened during the conference that we organized in 2020. And his quote highlights how interconnected the different issues regarding data and digital policies are at the international level. And what happens in one continent has an impact in others, and it is important to consider those discussions and those exploratory uh, things uh, in the context of the international uh, interdependencies as well. This is a work, and we see if you can move to the next slide, this is a work that is actually a continuation of something that Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network has been conducting in the previous years, first with a global status report in 2019, and then a regional status report in uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean. And the first message that I wanted to share that will be uh, reflected in the report uh, about Africa is that there are similarities, of course, and challenges that um, African actors are confronted with that are confronted, that are problems that other actors are confronted with as well. The fact that there are knowledge and policy silos dealing with digital issues and policies and that there is a plethora of unilateral measures that are adopted by governments independently. And that creates a lot of coordination challenges among uh, policy actors and um, uh, among uh, regions as well. 
There is also something that emerged in discussions that we've conducted previously, which is the tension between the objective of promoting data flows and uh, free data flows and the growing concerns that lead to the affirmation of the notion of digital sovereignty. And this was a part of a report that we actually produced last year uh, in, in, in for the, uh, the German government. There is a question regarding all regions regarding what is their role in the global debate about digital policies. There's a question of what is the narrative for each regions and also a concern about an expression that has grown, which is the notion of data extraction, i.e. what is the distribution of value in the digital economy between the different actors, the ones whose data is being used and uh, the ones who are using this data. And finally, it was the case in Latin America, it's of course the case in Europe, but there is an aspiration in Africa as well to have a degree and a strong degree of regional integration with goals like a digital single market, for instance. If we can move to the next slide, we had a few, um, a, a few questions that were asked to the people uh, we interviewed. And there was a very striking dual message regarding policy coordination. One, an overwhelming majority of people saying that African countries need to work more together on digital issues. And at the same time, there is a sense that this coordination is not as strong as it could be and that it should become stronger. So this is a two-faceted uh, issue regarding policy coordination. The next uh, elements that we want to share is that, yes, you can move to the next slide. The next uh, element that we want to share is that beyond the questions and the common challenges that Africa is confronted with, which are similar to others and to other regions, there are a certain number of specific challenges. Uh, one of them is the size of the continent, the number of countries and the geographic extension physically of the continent the disparity of distribution of populations, the um, very disparate levels of development between countries and even within countries, a significant persistence of societal and political tensions uh, in certain regions, the combination also of uh, regional political integration and also sub-regional uh, aggregations and coordinations. There are, and we will come back to that later, a certain number of uh, limitations uh, regarding the infrastructure that is available. And when we talk about infrastructure, it is also covering the institutional infrastructure for digital issues. Climate change related constraints are important for all countries in the world. And that has an impact on digital policies because of the environmental um, footprint of the digital economy. But there are a certain number of challenges that uh, Africa is confronted with because uh, of this. And finally, the idea that there are competing visions of what the digital society could be, and also the fact that uh, the African continent is a place where the development of policies is under the um, influence or um, a space for the confrontation between different models of the uh, development of the digital society. It can be a, a market-oriented approach. It can be a very state-oriented market approach. It can be a regulatory-oriented uh, approach. Basically, there is an international debate, and the African continent is sometimes torn, we feel, uh, between the different visions that other regions, uh, the US, Europe, or China, are trying to uh, impose on the digital society as a, as a whole. Then the next uh, element is that uh, there is a considerable appetite for a positive vision. And in particular, yes, the next slide, please, uh, Tracy. Uh, there was a question that was really important. And here again, there's an overwhelming message and. Uh, 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 majority of people considering that data flows between countries in Africa and between Africa and the rest of the world is or are essential and beneficial for the development of Africa and the digital society. 
And everybody is aware of some of the concerns that are legitimate regarding economic imbalances, security, or uh, human rights uh, questions. But there are several initiatives that show that there is a consciousness in Africa regarding the importance of digital and data policies for the continent. And some of the examples are here uh, listed. They are not exhaustive, but it's, um, it's important. And so the next, the next element um, to finish this general overview be before going into more detail is on the next slide, the um, around the notion, no, before. Um, yes, please. Yes, the African. Uh, there is the, <clears throat> the notion that there is a, a potential for developing a digital uh, single market um, through harmonization, through coordination, and um, a sufficient level of data flows. And that, in particular, the African continental free trade area could enable the achievement of this uh, objective of a common digital single market in Africa. And you see here that the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the proportion of responses is strongly uh, supporting the ID, even if unlike the other uh, questions, a significant proportion of people, about 20%, are on the edge and don't exactly know how much it will be uh, actually uh, sufficient and beneficial. So the next, the next slide is an introduction to what are the key, um, the key ta takeaways. Uh, this exercise and the takeaways, the, the takeaways that we're presenting here are not intended to be um, um, exhaustive. We want to highlight a certain number of issues that help structure the debate uh, moving forward. And those Four questions that we want to put forward and that will be detailed now uh, moving forward are one, what are the paths towards this objective of harmonization? The second one is when we look at infrastructure and the infrastructure for data in particular, what is the data infrastructure that is needed for the African continent or on what should the emphasis be? The third element is there are a lot of uh, issues that are related to sustainable development challenges uh, in Africa. And the question is how to leverage the potential of data sharing for development. And finally, last but not least, going back at a higher level, is how, to, how can Africa strengthen its voice in international fora? Once again, these are four issues that we want to highlight as key key findings or key questions to structure a debate moving forward. And this is not, of course, the end of a, of a discussion. We will be sustaining an ongoing discussion in that regard. So I now give you the floor back to, uh, to Tracy to uh, go in more detail with Research ICT Africa. Thank you very much, Bertrand. Thank you for that. Um, I will uh, move quickly into uh, the key findings of uh, the work that we have been doing. And for that, Research ICT Africa, who I've already um, introduced as the, uh, the authoring team for this report, will be carrying us through that. So we'll have with us Dr. Alison Gilwald, Executive Director for Research ICT Africa. We also have Dr. Dr. Andrew Renz, who is a senior researcher at ICT Africa, and Hanani Plomani, who is also a researcher at ICT Africa. So with that, I hand over to our authoring team. Thank you very much. Martin, do you want to uh, to highlight the uh, the use of the mentee uh, questions? Yes, Tracy. Um, before we go to Andrew and uh, Alison, on the four questions that 
Bertrand kindly highlighted as the dimensions of the uh, investigation. We have also prepared four relevant questions that we have included in a online menti that uh, can be accessed over the course of the presentation by the team from Research ICT Africa in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we welcome your input because, as you know, uh, the entire process has been a crowdsourcing and uh, data collection exercise. So please don't hesitate to um, uh, also provide your input on these questions. And if we still have enough time, that does not take away from hopefully a nice questions and answers part at the end. We'll also try to showcase them the results and we'll also repeatedly remind uh, in the chat with uh, the exact link how this can be accessed. And with this, handing over to you, Alison and Andrew, and I'll be controlling the slides from here on. Thank you very much. Um, thank you much, very much, Martin. I'm just going to speak about some of the, a little bit more, in a little more detail from the key findings on some of these um, issues. And one of them was really around these paths to harmonization. I think, you know, um, harmonization is an objective of many of the um, key frameworks that we're dealing with at the moment. It's a stated objective of the um, African Union's digital transformation strategy and the data policy framework that has arisen from that. The digital, the digital transformation strategy has been the sort of driving force of the last few years. Um, the data policy framework was actually just being um, adopted by member states as we were doing the first round of this research. So it's interesting to see to, as we get towards the end and people are becoming more aware of it, how people are anticipating what it might be able to do, but also what the challenges might be. Um, there are, of course, several um, sub-regional and thematic groupings and initiatives throughout the, the, throughout the continent, the regional level at ECOWAS. Um, in SADC, we have a number of initiatives, um, COMESA. Um, of course, we've got, you know, long-standing um, uh, conventions and we've got um, um, Africa uh, 2063. And then, of course, very importantly in this context has been the continental free trade um, um, area, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which has really provided an impetus for the, for the single market, for the digital um, single market. Um, a lot of the enablers that were envisioned for that, such as the Malabo Convention, um, which looked at both uh, cybersecurity and data protection, although um, uh, adopted many, many years ago, has not yet been ratified by sufficient countries for it to become operational. And this has raised question marks, we will see in the, in the in people's responses to what the African data policy framework can do with its very ambitious vision, but also, you know, its progressive realization of its objectives um, through um, various strategies, which we'll speak about a little bit um, further here, interoperability, the integration of, of, the, of, the, of the region. Um, large numbers of countries um, have, and, and you know, we have a very large number of countries, uh, five on the continent. Um, so reaching consensus on this is quite different from reaching consensus in many other regions in terms of a um, agreed framework. Um, and also because of these, of course, enormous um, political system diversity, you know, language diversity, and um, economic and, and cultural diversity as well. And then we've got enormous unevenness in the degrees of digital readiness um, for, you know, on, on the continent, um, and, and broadly, um, you know, and enormous amounts of um, uh, enormous deficits in many, many areas that hamper the um, data and digital um, economy. But I think what we see in these emerging frameworks now is that we can't all wait for, you know, to be um, harmonized on certain issues. Um, and in the Africa data policy framework, there's this um, progressive realization um, of the, of the ob objectives and of harmonization through, um, you know, starting with things that will integrate um, the um, African uh, single market, um, such as interoperability standards, so standards um, on, on data that would um, allow for national integration of data systems, common national integration of data systems, but then also allow for the um, data flows that are required for the African uh, common market to, to, to take off. Um, so there are a number of questions that arise from this, and I think, you know, as I said, this, this critical one in terms, in terms of learning lessons of challenges of implementation, of trying to get all states to the same point before you 
um, you move on, which we simply you know, don't have the luxury of it to some degree, um, is that you know, we can progress um, you know, right away with the adoption, for example, of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement with you know, functional interoperability um, as we progress towards more harmonized approaches. But that you know, initially there can be some domestication that would allow um, some immediate benefits and gains. And in that regard, the um, African Data Policy Framework recognizes the challenges of implementation and has an attached implementation phase, which supports um, ca capacity building, institutional and, and, and individual capacity building um, in countries who have completed this self-assessment um, tool. So there, I think there's an acknowledgement of that and there's an effort to try and address that. And then, of course, you know, we have this ongoing um, problem issue of being, you know, a, a union, but not um, bound um, by uh, an entity that can force regulation or, or, or directives that has allowed the EU to, you know, progress to reach the state of a, of, of a single market that it has. And of course, you know, it's done that over a long period of time, and many would argue that there have been certain um, challenges around that, particularly around the kind of lack of realization, you know, lack of progressive realization of some of those objectives for um, certain um, countries which, you know, lack the capacities to do so. But I think we have a lot more to discuss, so if we could go on to the next question. We can pick some of those up in discussion. And then I think this is you know, an important point that um, Bertrand's already referred to, is that we do still have um, data um, infrastructure gaps, or sorry, digital infrastructure gaps, broadband backbone infrastructure, um, you know, data warehouses, uh, data storage capacity um, across the continent. Uh, you know, I think there's been enormous progress, um, particularly in the area of, um, of, of, of mobile um, broadband. Um, which has really driven, you know, a take up on the continent. But we still see um, uh, in the indicators on the demand side that there's an enormous lag on the continent, and this manifests itself in the demand for certain, you know, broadband infrastructure for certain data centers. And this is what where we see the potential of the, you know, integrated common market of a single market that would provide many countries with the scale and scope in order to, um, to, to make those, those markets viable, to be part of a, a bigger market. But they're only able to be effectively part of that bigger market when they have certain kind of digital, digital readiness in order to participate, both infrastructure, both you know, institutional capacity to make sure that that um, infrastructure is effectively regulated and increasingly that they are part of you know, global governance collaborative efforts to um, enable data flows, but also to manage any harms that are associated with that. Um, so we continue while we look at, um, you know, at the data economy and we look at data governance, um, and of course data um, cross-border flows in that context, we need to continue to look at the entire digital ecosystem because of the unevenness that we, um, that we see on the continent. Um, and just, you know, the, the, I think the importance of data flows has been emphasized, but we do see in the um, uh, data policy framework and we see in some of the responses there that, you know, people are saying, of course, we got to get these data flows in order to drive the drive the economy, but we also need the necessary safeguards, the, the you know, protection, uh, risk mitigation um, around data protection, around you know, cybersecurity. And we, of course, have now many examples of, you know, being able to uh, even transfer, or well, certainly non-personal data is far easier to transfer. There's an imperative to re you know, exchange research data, you know, critical um, uh, security um, data, but also that, you know, we um, need to, we can also exchange personal data, which has been far more problematic, where we have reciprocal and agreed common standards that safeguard citizens at, on both sides and firms on both sides and both and countries on both sides. So although, you know, historically there's been a, a, a strong um, position of, 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 of data sovereignty and um, data localization, I think there's, a, you know, and, and we see this in some of the policy that's emerging, there's a realization that, you know, data has no value in and of itself, unless you have the capabilities, the capacity, the um, resources to process it, to add value, um, you simply, you know, you're sitting on kind of dead, dead data. And so there might be 
um, value in you know, storing your data somewhere where it can be more safely and securely stored. Um, and you know, you, you've got a, 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 there's a commercial benefit to that. There's a, a public value benefit to that, which is also an important part of this um, policy debate. It's been quite focused on you know, commercial um, data value creation, which is obviously a critical element, especially in the context of the, of the um, common market. But a very important part of this is also the public value of, um, of, of data and of the curation and the management and making available this data, um, this public data, in order for it to fulfill its function as a, as a digital public good. Thanks very much. Next slide. Maybe it's important at the transition to uh, remind people that there's the Menti uh, that is available uh, uh, online. Uh, the, the code has been uh, put again in the chat. It's uh, menti.com with entering the code. And you will have the uh, questions for the first two um, uh, presentations. Please contribute to this mentee to get your um, sense of where we're going. Thank Go you, Bertrand. And now Hanani will speak to the next slide. OK. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to take us through, I think, the next two slides, um, basically focusing on the relationship between data and development, um, basically answering the questions of why cross-border data flows are so important and why we find ourselves in the situation where we have to actually discuss this. Um, so first of all, just right off the bat, um, there are a lot of societal ambitions and challenges regarding the SDGs. Um, in the African context, I think also it's important to mention that a lot of these SDGs have been given life um, through Agenda 2063. And so the overarching themes or questions that are around those um, really have to revolve around things such as access to information, um, you know, research, water, agriculture. In fact, some studies that were conducted by the United Nations have actually shown that um, data has a role to play in the achievement of um, a lot of these um, SDGs. In fact, all 17 in some way or other can actually be positively um, um, influenced by data flows. Um, but also, it's also worth noting that um, where we advocate for some of these data flows and cross-border data flows, that there are some other issues, um, challenges around that, which is usually to do with climate. So for instance, the setting up of data centers and the likes and the energy uh, requirements of setting up such data centers might have negative um, impacts on the climate. So it's really just a game of balancing the two, but um, at least from a developmental point of view, um, it has been found that um, all SDGs across the board can in fact be influenced in one way or the other by data. So um, going on also, um, as I've already said, data access and sharing is quite key to these challenges. Um, so how actually how do we actually get to a point where data access and sharing is um, is at the fore of everything? So one of the points that we try to um, you know to bring to the fore is that data standardization or formats. Uh, okay, somebody lost me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so how do we achieve this? We need to establish data standardization or formats for interoperability. Um, this generally means that um, from device to device, from place to place, or from server to server, um, the data must be able or should be standardized enough to be able to be read by different people in different locations without um, being um, you know, localized to one or without having to exist in data silos. Um, there's also a need to foster governance of data communities, um, especially across borders. Um, you know, this is through, you know, looking at institutions such as commons or stewardship trusts. Um, a bit tricky on that one, but, you know, um, it's one of those that I think also needs to be looked at in one way or the other. And then also there's a need to look at the modalities of data cooperation, especially between, um, you know, people that are on two sides of the spectrum. So we're looking at private companies, civil society actors and public authorities. They each um, pursue different um, developmental goals. And so there's a need to kind of look into how these modalities can be looked at and how um, we can come to a sort of common ground. And then also, um, we need to also ensure that there's sovereign data communities for communal data, especially on this continent where um, there is a rife history of um, data being harvested and not being used actually to further the development of the continent. 
um, there needs to be a bit more um, you know, reinforcing of some of these sovereign data communities. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and then uh, the next point is on the role of Africa in global data, in global governance fora. I think Bertrand has already um, alluded to the fact that the voice of Africa has um, often been questioned in terms of um, data governance on the international fora. So um, as I said on slides, data governance is a high topic on the international agenda in fora where African stakeholders are not really as active as they should be. And um, one of the complaints that a lot of the participants in our study found was that um, they also argue that Africa is usually on the receiving end of regulations from outside. Um, and in the absence of our own um, laws to actually you know, impose on them, it seems like it's a one-way street. Um, Alison has already said that although we have the Malabo Convention, the Malabo Convention has not yet been ratified by enough um, states. So it, in essence, it's just a, sort of a regulation that is lying in wait. And so in the absence of that, really, it seems that Africa is on the receiving end of a lot of regulations that are not for Africans and are not by Africans. And so um, there are also tensions related to the prevailing data extraction capitalism, right? Um, as I've already spoken about, um, you know, some of these data communities where a lot of data is just being extracted, but there's not enough value being created, especially on the African continent. And so the, some of the key questions that will help us to um, you know, strengthen the role of Africa's voice in the global um, fora is that we need to first of all answer whether there's an African narrative in the digital society. Um, okay, lost me a bit. Okay, um, so as I was saying, the, somebody's talking, no? Okay, um, just to say um, there needs to be an African narrative in the digital society. Um, there's a lot of conflicting views on this, um, but generally what we found is that a lot of people seem to think that there is a lack of a narrative, um, an African narrative in the digital society. And so also uh, we think that there needs to be an impact assessment by other regions of the extraterritorial impact of the regulations to prevent unintended consequences. Um, none of these really have been looked at per se. And um, especially in the context of Africa, this might be something that is very important. And then also there's a need to um, question what interfaces can be developed with global processes. Um, maybe for lack of a better word, interfaces in this context loosely refers to what other forums can be developed in order for us to kind of um, sit down and really have a look at these issues and debate them within the unique African context. Um, yeah, I think that's it from my end. I think next slide. Thank you very much, um, Hanani, for that. Uh, and I think that at this point, we will uh, open up the floor for uh, <coughs> questions from the audience. Please, this is your opportunity to ask a question to the authoring team that are here with us today. Maybe, uh, maybe Tracy, if I can jump in here. First of all, there are very interesting exchanges in the uh, in the chat, so please don't hesitate to have a look and and mention uh, comments there. There's one thing I wanted to highlight in this um, on this slide, and particularly the first bullet point, which is there is a question of how much African actors are active in international fora, of course, but there is also a fundamental structural question, which is a lot of those issues are being discussed in places where African actors are not present. If you look at the uh, G7, there's no African country. If you look at the G20, there's South Africa, but not necessarily many others, apart from when they're invited. And if you look at the OECD, there's no African country in the OECD, unless I'm mistaken. And so there is a challenge here that is not only the question of the engagement of the African actors and hence the question of interfaces. Um, there's also the question of these issues of regarding data policies in general are being discussed either in regions such as the European Union that adopts legislation that have an impact on African actors, whether they want it or not. And second, that there is a need to find new ways to have the African voice be heard in 
fora where it is not necessarily participating. And this is the uh, the mention of the of the second point in the in the box on the right, which is that the more international actors and particularly governments are adopting in the data space or in the digital policy space measures that have extraterritorial impact, the more there is a need for a sort of impact assessment on what is the con what are the consequences, intended or non-intended on other regions when, for instance, the US or the Europe or other countries are adopting uh, architectures. So this uh, third point, or, sorry, this fourth question is not only about what Africa can do, but also what uh, other regions need to take into account when they develop policies that impact Africans or Latin America for that matter. Thank you, Bertrand. If I could um, also just um, add to that, because I think you know you, you've highlighted that historically, and because of colonialism, our there was some kind of normative consensus, you know, tied aid or whatever, however it happened, to the kind of investments and the regulatory reforms that were um, happening, you know, um, in the area of digital over a long period of time, and I think you know there's an increasing um, absence of that uh, normative consensus. I think there's some universal standards and principles that are retained. But I think there's also with, you know, um, with the um, rise of um, Chinese technology prowess and, um, you know, significant massive invest investments on the continent um, that don't go with um, the same normative uh, ties that you get, you've had historically um, with, with aid and, and, and investment um, from the West. Um, there are a number of, uh, social practices, um, political practices that are accompanying those infrastructural investments. And so there's more talk now, um, and there's meant to be some figures on this, but I haven't been able to um, get them from a reliable source. But there are a number of countries who are seeing merits in the um, Chinese merit system, um, it, you know, in going along with the infrastructure that they're receiving, their surveillance infrastructure or their physical infrastructure that they're seeing. So there's, there's all, you know, as you were saying in the beginning, there is this um, kind of clash of, uh, of, of norms, I guess. Um, and then, of course, you know, very strong African norms that have never really, you know, come, come to the table. Um, and, you know, as you say, Africa's primarily been a you know, standards receiver, not a standard setter. And so the question I think around many of these um, um, discussions that are emerging, these frameworks that are emerging are really around an African voice, an African narrative of what, you know, it's going to mean for Africa to not only, you know, sit at the table of these international discussions, but show leadership on behalf, represent African interests. Um, you know, something that really has a lot more agency than some of the discussions in the past about, you know, how can we, you know, have a representative from Africa at an international meeting? Thank you very much, Bertrand and Alison. Um, there were a couple of comments in the, the chat box. And before we go there, there's uh, Ephraim uh, Percy Kenyan who has a question. So I'm going to open the floor to him. Go ahead, Ephraim. You're still on mute. Hello, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, okay, thank you. It's not a question, but uh, it's just a statement uh, and also a bit of a question and a statement. So one, um, this research is very timely, especially right now as you're talking about AFICTA and um, uh, moving uh, more uh, trade and, and moving towards digital trade and uh, digital single market in Africa. Uh, I'm just curious about um, if the research, because this has not maybe been talked about in this call, um, if the, uh, the template uh, uh, model laws that were there, for example, for the ESC, for the SADC, um, for the ECOWAS and others, if that has played a role um, uh, and how, how that, that fits in into the development of this. And also there was that debate that we're having on the chat about um, the Malabo Convention uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the, whether they are viable at this time or uh, or there's need to update as they are. Um, but just to note, there are 13 countries that have uh, ratified, uh, two more are yet to, to ratify. Um, I think that's, that's that. I'm just curious about that, um, the, 
model laws um, at the regional level, um, uh, at the REC level. Thank you. So I'll speak to that. Um, so yes, we did um, take cognizance of the model laws, particularly um, in the, the two RECs with the most advanced um, the model laws and other instruments, so uh, West Africa and East Africa, uh, less progress in um, SADC. Um, but we also uh, looked to um, the extent to which those are, are helpful for continental coordination, uh, particularly with, uh, as I think you mentioned in the chat, um, the African continental free trade area and um, how the RECs are, are crucial to that, but also um, perhaps in driving you know, quicker integration and, and, and the free trade areas are um, enabled, able to do. But um, also the way in which it's still a patchwork. So I think uh, even with all the policy instruments we have, we still have very much a patchwork, a, a path towards harmonization rather than a, a possibility of something that looks as, as harmonized, as uniform as, let's say, the European Union, as an example. Instead, what we, I think, have is not only a path towards um, harmonization, but the idea that some regions might move quicker uh, to, towards harmonization and that some countries, um, even across regions, might move quicker towards harmonization uh, precisely because we can't move in a lockstep. And that actually brings us quite, for two, you know, helpfully to the question of the Malabo Convention. Uh, in, in our research, the African Union has, um, I think, uh, implicitly acknowledged that Malabo needs updating, but th their approach is that um, people should sign Malabo um, and, and, then, and then collectively work together to update it. Of course, another option would be to, um, to deal with many of the issues in the protocols to the African Monumental Free Trade Area. Uh, during the course of this year, intellectual property is being negotiated. And the competition protocol is also essential to both digital um, economies, but also specifically to data, with data being potentially something which competitors would need access to. Um, and then the e-commerce protocol um, could also be uh, a, a way of trying to update Malabo. But I think we're still, we don't know yet which is the best way to update uh, Malabo. I think there is um, quite a large consensus needs to be updated, um, and um, and 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 to sort of may, maybe be a bit more integrated into uh, questions of digital economy. I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and does anyone have anyone else have other questions? I'll just check here in the chat box. There were some regarding uh, the data centers. And perhaps the person that made that comment, I'll just see here. Manny, if um, you wanted to share with us that, or I can read it out. And it was about regarding data centers and climate change, and what are the opportunities for the continent to look more into sustainable energy transition. Uh, and the continent is endowed with vast reserves of renewable energy, which could be crucial in taking up the energy load of the establishment of data centers. So um, did you want to expound on that more, Manny, or? I think there's another message. Yes, yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I don't think we can hear you, Manny, but um, you've put uh, a further comment that research indicates that for 55 AU members, there are up to 25 uh, states that host data centers, and the gaps also visible within the sub-regions. -re sub All states may not be able to establish data centers over the next few years, Bearing in mind all the barriers, costs, energy requirements, environmental concerns, et cetera. However, there are cooperation prospects around the tier 
three natural <laughs> data centers. So thank you very much for your comment. And um, if there are no other comments from the floor. Tracy, it's if it's Benjamin um, asked a no, question. Sorry. Tracy, I, I just wanted to um, just respond to Mani's very important um, points that he's been making about green energy and to indicate that it was one of the very, you know, um, questions that were very much surfaced um, in, the, in, the, in the discussions and debates, both the question of, you know, um, you know, every every country requiring a data center, and actually the the lack of demand for that currently, but then also the you know the the real um, cost benefits and the potentials um, around um, you know um, consolidation of that at a point where we do have you know hydroelectric power or some alternative you know uh, green energy, and there's a lot of work being done on that um, in in the, the in the sort of leapfrog, leapfrog language to you know to our legacies where we actually don't have um, electricity to um, be you know using solar power for example and to create these african um, hubs now there are obviously you know questions about what kind of power and the extent of power but currently um, you know the, the biggest um, data center in south africa for example is paying more for um, power for energy than for um, for bandwidth so you know, it's a, where it is available <laughs> sporadically. Um, it is a great cost to the continent. So this, the importance about um, you know cooperation and prospects around the the tier three neutral data centers that Manu makes um, is something that we really do want to want to surface in the report, and we would look forward to having a a, a deeper engagement on that. Um, absolutely, thank you, and Bertrand. I think you had a point that you would like to make. Yeah, actually, um, I think it's um, it's a it's a nice moment. We will have the opportunity to uh, to introduce uh, to have Martin present some of the results of the of the Menti. And thank you for those who have contributed. And I hope that um, those who have not are still are still doing it. Just a few a few things going back to um, first of all, some of the comments in the chat. I I, I strongly recommend. A very an interesting element of discussion regarding uh, enforceability, compliance, and the capacity of verifying that the uh, agreements that are being made are actually uh, being enforced and monitored. Uh, another element regarding uh, something that we could have mentioned, which is that indeed there are some uh, countries uh, in Africa who have signed up to the uh, Council of Europe um, Cybercrime Convention, the Budapest Convention. So there are participations in some international uh, fora. Uh, and there's another, another element which is uh, was light, highlighted that the African Union indeed doesn't have the ex equivalent tools to what the European Union has in terms of the directive or the um, regulations. The reason why we mentioned that here was not to take inspiration from the substance of the regulations that take place in Europe, but more to raise the question of the difference between an objective of full harmonization and an objective of providing a framework that enables a modicum of variability between the different countries. And there was a comment, I think it was by uh, Evan Sutherland uh, in the chat, saying that when there is a treaty, of course, there usually are different modalities of implementation at the national level, depending on the degree of precision of the treaty in question. We just wanted to raise the question uh, because the theme of a full digital single market in Africa is a very lofty and, and great ambition, but there is, as we had discussed, a notion of a progressive path uh, towards this. The final element regarding the, um, the question of data centers, uh, one of the objectives of making the parallel with connectivity is that 20 or 25 years ago, the connectivity of Africa was really, really low. And in the meantime, a significant progress has been done, not only by public infrastructure, but also by commercial cables that are coming here. And I read somewhere that there are eight new cables that are in preparation for the next two years. And this is an inspiration because it has progressively developed and it has progressively developed in connection with the distribution of populations in, in Africa, even if there are still 
big zones where the backbones internally are not sufficiently developed. But the question of data centers could follow the same sort of path. And one of the questions we wanted to put on the table is the fact that for the digital companies or the different uh, application developers in Africa, if they do not have access to data centers and cloud services that are performing, they will not be able to develop their own activities. And so one of the, uh, of the things is, what is the global, uh, sorry, the regional perspective and the progressive development of data center clusters so that there is sufficient data flows between the countries uh, without going to the notion that every single country should absolutely have data centers immediately. And also because in the long term, there are conditions regarding access to electricity, um, climate conditions, and various other elements of infrastructure that can limit the capacity of developing data centers absolutely everywhere. So we just wanted to highlight this, and maybe I'll give the floor to um, to Andrew uh, before we we can briefly share the uh, the Menti results. Andrew, Sorry. Andrew, go ahead. I've unmuted. Um, I think I should answer briefly to uh, Frank who asked a question in the chat. Um, Frank uh, from Adapo, Adapo. Um, so we didn't look at, from a sort of philosophical uh, perspective or sociological perspective, uh, the, the, the different African conceptions of privacy. What we rather looked at is the demand or the concern of respondents that there should be personal data protection. And generally respondents indicated that they, they believe that should be there and in our uh, some of our previous discussions in the um, knowledge dialogue workshops, this was directly linked to trust. So personal data um, is, uh, and concerned over protection of personal data, um, isn't rooted necessarily so much in a um, sort of philosophical theory around privacy, but it's simply trust, what people will do with that data, whether those are companies or governments, and, and to establish trust in the online environment, it was pretty clear from our respondents that um, there needs to be personal data protection. In fact, uh, beyond that, it gives generally support um, for, for that human rights should prevail online. And again, this was related directly to trust. Um, and so without appropriate protection for people online, including personal data, including other human rights, what, what we'd get would be that people wouldn't simply trust online environments. They wouldn't entrust their data to these. So it's quite pragmatic, um, I think, on behalf of most of the respondents, uh, an awareness that people are simply not going to trust um, online environments um, unless they have appropriate protection. Thank you very much for responding to that, Andrew, and to everybody for your for your um, responses. At this time, it's almost three o'clock. We've got two minutes uh, left, and I just wanted to share with you. Uh, we have so much to to share um, regarding the report, and this uh, this was really to give you a snapshot of some of the key findings. Um, the report will be launched at the IGF. The Internet um, uh, uh, Governance Forum in Addis Ababa on the on Monday the 28th of November between 5:20 and 6:20, where we'll present some of the key findings. And there is an opportunity for networking afterwards. So if you would like to stay behind and network with uh, the authoring team with ourselves at INJ, please do so. Stay on the line. And uh, there was going to be an opportunity to show some of the results. And if you are staying behind, we can share those. And otherwise, all the, all the resources that have been shared today will be sent to <clears throat> the participants. And um, so, yes, yeah, so if you would like to stay behind, uh, Martin will share some of those results. Yeah, we can use the last two minutes to do this as a transition to the, uh, the next 15. Go ahead, Martin. Yes, thank you very much, Tracy, and thank you to the speakers and to the participants. So uh, let me know if you can see my screen. 
So mm -hmm. here we basically have the first uh, mental results of the of the of the first kind of framing questions. To what extent there's a need for a progressive path towards regulatory harmonization? Again, it's not a, a representative sample, but you see we had 37 submissions uh, during the call, out of which 29 uh, strongly agree with this need. Uh, it's just one neutral, so there seems to be uh, overarching agreement uh, with that statement. Uh, when going uh, to the next one, uh, here, 30 submissions uh, concerning the need of a coordinated strategy around Africa's data infrastructure, in particular the data centers angle um, that we have mentioned. Also here, there seems to be strong agreement uh, and also two neutral positions that are here out of the 30. Moving on to the question related to the data strategy and uh, to what extent it would be needed to achieve uh, the sustainable development goals. Uh, we have one person that strongly disagrees with the statement. Uh, we won't, of course, disclose who that is, but uh, it's an interesting uh, kind of uh, spread, statistically speaking, uh, but overarchingly uh, strong agreement also in this regard, and we'll dig deeper when analyzing also the stakeholder groups of the people that submitted. And last but not least, uh, concerning the question of whether or not Africa needs to strengthen its voice in international fora, and uh, joining in, I think, also the realizations during the presentations. Um, there is a lot of work already being done, but there's the understanding of our participants here, at least those that have submitted in the Menti, that uh, there needs to be a strengthening of its voice or the voices uh, in the international fora. And I think this will provide them a lovely um, kind of starting point for a follow-up discussion now in the the next few minutes for those of you that would like to uh, stay behind, as Tracy mentioned. And if this is not the case, we are greatly looking forward to welcoming many of you, be it virtually or potentially in person on the 28th for the launch of the entire report, which then will also be made available online. And with this, I'm giving back uh, the virtual microphone to my colleagues. And I think we can, Tracy, stop the recording here for the uh, the formal meeting and keep people uh, for uh, 15 minutes afterwards.